Good morning. How are you guys all doing today? Yeah? It's good to be here. I've been on vacation for the last week, went up to Toronto, got to see Niagara Falls. That's an amazing sight. Just you roll right into that and you feel like you're going to get just swallowed up in that water. It's, it's pretty cool. Well, it's good to have you. I just want to welcome those who are watching us online or at uh, the theater or South Hills. Thank you for being with us uh, today. Uh, A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to officiate the wedding of this couple, this young couple. I'd had the opportunity to kind of do their premarital counseling, and they asked me to officiate, which is always a great honor for me. And I'm standing there at the ceremony, and the couple's in front of me, and I get to that part where you have to introduce them, you know, I'm going to now introduce you so-and-so. I'd say his name is Bob James Smith. So here's what I say. I want to introduce you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Bob and James Smith. I'm like, that sounds like a same-sex couple. That, that can't be right. So then I, I try to back it up and do it again. I said, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Bob and Sue James Smith. I'm like, no, nah, that's just as weird, man. And so the couple at that point, she left out this big belly laugh, and the couple walks down the aisle, and I'm left standing like, I'm a big idiot, man. I can't say anything right. And, and then it gets worse. So um, the, the, uh, the cere- you know, we, we go to the cocktail hour and kind of hang out a little bit. It's in downtown Campbell. And then they call us all back for the, for, the, for the meal. And it's this cool taco kind of bar thing that they have. And so I, our table is one of the last tables. And I load up with you know, tacos and refried beans and, and a fruit salad. And, and when I come back to my table, the, 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 the patio was a sunken table or a sunken area. And, I, and our table is the last table. And I forgot the sunken part. And so I step out, and there's nothing there, and I see myself, you know, that slow motion thing. I'm like heading right for the table. And I look, and all these people are just nicely dressed. And I'm like, no, no, no. And so I grab the plate, and I hit it, and it spins back on me. I am covered in tacos. I mean, I've got, I've got refried beans on my tie, on my shoes. Somehow I had it up inside my coat. I'm like, I don't even know how that happens. And, when I go to sit down, the guy right across from me, Lisa's kind of patting me down and helping me you know, clean up, and the guy goes, I think he's got it in his hair. And I had this big <laughs> clump right there. I'm like, ah, this is just, and when I sit down, the lady right next to me puts her purse up and she starts taking my fruit salad out of her purse. I'm like, and it's at that moment, at that moment, I hear, I hear the bride say from the old, far, far corner of the patio, that's what you get for getting our names wrong. I'm like, oh, oh. I mean, she was just kidding, but I was like, yes, oh. oh, my goodness. Don't you hate it, though? You try to do everything that's right, and you just, you just mess it up. I mean, at least that's, that's what happens for me sometimes. It was funny, too, because about six months earlier, I was at a worship leader event with all these pastors from the Bay Area, and it was a really nice home, and they had a pool that was an endless pool. And I walked right into the pool, baby. I just like walked right in. I'm like, there is just clearly, I'm just warning you now, I'm kind of on a six month increment. You know, every six months I'm falling somewhere. So about Christmas time, just keep your distance. I just want to warn you now, clearly I am too clumsy to be let out in public. So I just admit that. But that just, that just seems how life goes sometimes. You try to do everything that's right, put it all together, hold it all together, and it just crumbles all apart right before you. And you know, maybe for you, you're, you're at work, get an order for some customer and, and you're trying, you know, everybody's trying to work to fill it and then it gets messed up and next thing you know, you're on the phone and this guy is just reaming you, you're just yelling at you and like, I just trying to help you, man. Or, uh, you know, maybe you're uh, in the middle of a family conflict and so you walk in and you try to help, you know, you try to facilitate the conversation and next thing you know, everybody's getting angry, next thing you know, they're looking at you and they're blaming you and you're like, whoa, what, I just stepped into this and everybody walks away, they're ticked off, you're standing there and they're all blaming you and like, I was only trying to help. Or maybe, like me, you woke up one morning and uh, you had a huge plumbing plumbing problem. And so you call the plumber and he comes in and he tells you it's going to be $12,000 to fix this problem. And you're left there like, oh man, what am I going to do? You got no water, you got a huge plumbing bill, and you're like, oh my goodness, how is this going to get any messier? 
Life sometimes feels like it unravels, doesn't it? And today what I hope you see, I want to share with you. I've been, I've been studying these for the last uh, few months now. I'm really excited. I hope you see that when we get an eternal perspective on what is happening in heaven and who God is, that it has the power, that, that perspective has the power to change us and give us this, this great sense of hope. We've been in a series the last few weeks um, called Summer Mixtape, and if you've been joining us, it's been really fun just to see these different songs throughout Scripture. Scripture's a lot, a, lots of different kinds of literature, and uh, the songs are one of the literatures that, that we can study and see who God is and, and who uh, we are in the light of that. And um, I had one of our uh, local artists, they did a rendering of each one of the songs. There was uh, songs of ascension, uh, songs that teach us about coming and approaching God. There, there are songs of confession, songs of deliverance, um, songs of lament, and then there's what Jay taught last week, which is songs of honor. And the last song is a song I want to teach. It's called an encore song. Now, you know what an encore is, right? You go, you go see your favorite band. I got a chance a few years ago to see you two. And all the, the whole concert's going on. I'm like, when are they going to do Where the Streets Have No Name? When are they going to do that? And the band leaves. And you're like, no, no. And then all of a sudden, that, you hear that little guitar riff, that little dotted eighth rhythm thing. And you're like, here it comes. And the place just erupts and goes crazy. And that's what kind of an encore song. It's just like, up to this point, things have been good. It's, it's a good concert, but the end is not there yet. There is more. The best is yet to come. And the encore core song we're going to study today is that kind of a song. It's like, it's a great cap uh, to all that we know about God's story. And it shows us, ultimately, what we were created to do and created to be. So I want to look at this out in the book of Revelation to study this passage together. But before we do... I just want to invite us to slow ourselves down. You know, we come in the building and you get settled with, settled with your coffee and stuff. Now let's just look to God and ask that he would just cause an inner quietness so we can really listen to what he has for us. So let's pray along with me. Father, we come into your presence this morning and, and uh, we're delighted to be here. And as we look at these sacred pages, it's not a textbook. Father, these are pages that you breathe into. This is your holy word. And so we ask that you would create in us just this really listening ear. As we bump into these images of metaphors and symbols, it can easily kind of be confusing and distract us. So what we ask that you would do is cause in us just to, to see clearly who you are and what you've done. And then skillfully, Father, through the, the, the miraculous power of your spirit, for each and every one of us in this room, would you help us, God, to know what do we do with that? How does that change how we live? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is written to a group of people who are feeling like life is getting all messed up. Life for them is hard. Life is challenging. Life is difficult. And if you were a follower of Christ in those times... Being a Christian could jeopardize you financially. It could mean uh, harm to your emotional health. It could even, in some circumstances, get you killed. So it's in this situation that there are a lot of believers experiencing real discouragement. And this book is written to them to give them a sense of hope. Now, in what we're going to see today, there's this heavenly perspective that changes things for us in the midst of our messy frustrating lives at times. And what I hope you catch is that when life becomes a complete mess, moving toward God in authentic worship will radically change our perspective. You see, worship is this movement towards God that has the potential to transform our focus and give us a heavenly perspective in the midst of whatever it is we are facing. If you have your Bible or your flat screen device, I would just invite you to take it out, turn to the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, and we're going to look in chapter 4. When we study a song, it's helpful for us to kind of get the song format, the structure. When I was in music school, I took a class um, called Structural Analysis, and for a whole semester, we learned how to tear apart songs and, and see them structurally. And what's helpful when you study a song that way is you get to, it, the song becomes a little bit less chaotic. You're able to kind of track with the motion of the song, and it actually makes it more memorable. And the song we're going to look at today is less like the songs we sing today, where they have you know, a verse and a chorus and maybe a bridge. This song is what I would call a symphony, and it has four 
symphonic movements. First, there's this movement inward. And then you're going to see this movement downward. And then you're going to see a movement upward. And then the last is just a movement backwards. So we're going to track this song and each movement of it. Now, when we drop in on the action, it's written to John. And John is getting this real rare opportunity to see what's going on in heaven at that very moment. John is a guy who has to be discouraged in his life right now. He was able to be a part of this wonderful movement, this powerful movement of Jesus and on his leadership team. But now things had gotten really difficult and really hard. Many of the followers that were with John at the beginning had already been martyred for uh, being a Christian. Domitian was the wicked ruler that, that, that reigned during that time, and he was unleashing on followers of Christ an insane amounts of persecution. And because of all this, John has actually gotten exiled to the island of Patmos, and he's living there in isolation. And at that moment, John has to be thinking, oh my goodness, how could this thing get any more messed up? And it's at that point that God lets him see this wonderful picture from Scripture, and he he invites him to see the scene. It's almost like this curtain is going to get pulled back, and now he's going to get to see what is going on in heaven at the moment he's facing that difficulty. Read along with me in verse 1. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. Now, when I think of a trumpet, in my mind, I kind of think of that Charlie Brown teacher, wah, 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 you know that thing? But that's not like this. It's like if a trumpet player came in here and started blasting, boom, baby, right away, our attention would just be riveted to it. And that's what happens for John. This voice, like a trumpet, just grabs his attention. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. That phrase is significant because in the midst of what John is going through, he's got to be thinking, is this, is this what happens? Is this what happens? I just get, everything gets torn apart? And what the angel is saying is, Hey, this isn't God's end game. There's something else going on. I know it's crazy for you right now, and I know it's confusing, but take comfort in this. Something else is going on right at, uh, something else is taking place right at this moment. Verse 2 says this, and instantly I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and a rumble of thunder. Imagine this picture. Everything seems to be centered and focused around one person. There is no confusion in this image about who is in charge. And you see this first movement now draws us inward and is focused on the one who sits on the throne. It draws us inward to focus in on God. It's like John's being told this, I know you're confused. I know it looks like things have completely fallen apart, but you can rest assured of this. God is on his throne. And everything in this, in this picture that he sees kind of supports that. You have this uh, kind of circle around God of like a, a rainbow. We see rainbows now, and they are a reminder from Genesis of God's promise. And then you see, did you hear, hear the part about the 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones? It's thought to be, by many scholars, that the 12 leaders from the tribe of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles from the New Testament They make up these 24 elders, and they are kind of like spiritual leaders for us that model this wonderful bowing down before before the one who sits on the throne. And then you add this this thunder and lightning and this scene, and it must have viscerally drawn John into this experience in in a way that just captivates his attention and centers him on the one who is on the throne. This idea of centering is so important for you and I. Um, I was reading a book by uh, John Ortberg called Soul Keeping, and he has this quote about it, and I want to read it. He says, a soul disconnected from its center is like an unplugged computer. It's like a fish left on the bank of a river that would give it life. Eventually, it crashes. It dies. The soul cannot be centered without 
God. Our souls need to have that same kind of focus. It's at that moment when it's inwardly focused on God that it brings us life and health and strength. All the things around us, the circumstances in your life and my life, may shout at you that God has lost control. Be encouraged by this. God is on the throne. He's on the throne right now. And the lyrics of the first song that is sung all enforces this idea. There's these, you're going to hear these freaky creatures kind of flying around God, and they represent the different parts of God's created, uh, uh, the beings of the air, beings of the sea, uh, beings of the land, and listen to what they sing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. What are these creatures singing? What's the lyrics of their song? They're singing of the impeccable character of God. And they start off by declaring his holiness, meaning he is morally flawless. He is almighty. That means he has the power to, whatever he wants to do, boom, he's able to do it. My theology professor would say it like this, by the mere act of his will, he can produce whatever he wills. That's amazing power. We should not be allowed to have that kind of power. God alone is allowed to have that. Why? Because he's morally flawless. He's always good. And then the idea that who was and is and is to come, nothing will ever change that truth. And so this inward focus, these lyrics that are sung are all in worship to God, his character, and in what he's done. And that's not hard for us to understand because what I want to submit to you today is we are all wired to worship. The four living creatures just demonstrate what is naturally innate in all of us, and that is we are all worshipers. And the question for you and for me today is, what will we worship? What will you choose to worship? We always have this thought that worship is kind of this, this religious activity that we go to, and we can choose whether we do it or not. No, 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 you guys, that is not true. You are a worshiper, whether you worship in this building whether you worship this thing or that thing. What I submit to you today is, what will you worship? Let me give you an example. Here's a guy. He's a football guy, okay? Nothing wrong with football. All week long, he's reading the statistics about it. He's watching SportsCenter. He's reading the paper. He's studying football, right? And then the weekend comes, and what does he do? He puts himself in, in the position to be near the object of what he adores, and the minute he's there, what does it do to him? It changes him. His face lights up. He gets, he gets bummed out when his team doesn't go or the calls don't go his way. He gets excited when they score a touchdown. His moods change based off of what he's seeing and what he's adoring, what he's enjoying, right? Nothing wrong with football. What's going on there? That, my friends, that is worship. That is worship. And what I want to submit to you today is you can tell what you truly worship by observing your reaction when something blocks your ability to enjoy it. Let me say that again. You can tell what you truly worship by observing your reaction when something blocks your ability to enjoy it. The truth for all of us is we are worshipers, and we will worship some object, something in front of us. We will put that. Some of you will leave this building today, and you will, you will worship your families. Some of you will worship your careers. Some of you will worship money or sex, or entertainment, or celebrities. I don't know about you, but my heart sank just a little bit when I saw the allegations about Bill Cosby and his sexual misconduct with multiple women. I mean, here's an individual who, for most of what we saw in the 80s, was seen as this wonderful parent, really loving father, and now he's, he's being exposed as the complete opposite of that. And what it reminds me for all of us is we can choose to worship something that is not worthy to be worshipped or someone who's not worthy to be worshipped. There's a quote from John Calvin. He says this, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. The problem for you and I isn't finding something to worship, but it's choosing the right thing to worship because what's in all of us is to, to take something, and I watch this all the time. I watch it in my life. That's why I know it's true for you too. We find something to get focused. It could be a hobby. It could be whatever. The question is, is that really worthy 
of our worship, what should have preeminence in our lives. What this picture shows us is life lives the best when God is at that center. So the first movement is inward and centering on God. And then the next movement is this wonderful movement downward in reverence and submission. It's a downward movement in acknowledgement of who God is. Read with me in verse 9. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. Now, this scene in the ancient world would have been very familiar to John as contemporaries. It's a, scene, it's a courtroom scene, or a, 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 a throne room scene. And in thrones in those times, there was a throne, and there was attendants around the throne, and people would bow down in submission and sing songs of worship. Dominus, uh, oh, do, excuse me, Domitian was the, the, the ruler in that time, and he had a phrase called Dominus et Deus, which means Lord and God. The rulers in that time thought of themselves not only as the ones in charge, but they thought of themselves as actual deities, actual gods. And as the curtain gets pulled back, John's able to see that it's only God, truly God, who the elders are worshiping, who they are falling down, and they're falling down to acknowledge God's authority in submission to him. The movement is really what is, what is really happening in our hearts, and God, he's seeing them submit to God's authority. I like this definition that, John, uh, that Tim Keller has about worship, and I want to read it to you. It says this, what does it mean to worship? It means to so fill your heart, to so let the value of God, the worth of God, sink in, that you respond in wholehearted reorientation of your life. You may think that just because you're in a worship service like this that you're worshiping, Unless there is a downward movement in submission to God, it's just lip service, man. Our entire lives and our beings need to be reoriented around God and his authority. And what you're going to see continually as the scene unfolds is the elders model this downward posture. And and the the physical posture of getting down on our knees um, can be physical, and it can also help us just kind of anchor that thought. Um, I was with uh, a few friends, actually Josh and uh, um, Josh Fox and Andy Gridley. We got a chance to on a creative uh, team, and we got a chance to get away for a few days up in the mountains, and we did some creative planning around Christmas, if you can believe it. And when we were up in the hills, <clears throat> we, we had been inside for a few days, and, and Andy said, hey, I know of a trail that we can hike to that has this wonderful vista and has waterfalls. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. So we headed out, and we go on this hike, and, and we get to the end, and we get to this place where there's, it, it's like at 180 degrees. You can look for, for miles, and you see the waterfall, but it had this like 300-foot drop-off. Yeah, you, there's Josh sitting right there. And, and what happened is, it's, maybe it's the junior high boy in me, but I want to get right to the edge, you know? And as I'm walking out, nobody had to ask me to do this. <clears throat> nobody had to tell me to do it. But I, I just instinctively, I, maybe it's because I fall a lot. I don't know if that's this. <clears throat> I, but I instinctively just kind of got down on my hands and knees, and I started crawling right to the edge so that I could look over. I didn't, well, it's like this, this edge. I, pro, I feel pretty comfortable having my toes here. I'm not, I'm not too fearful about much right here. So what is it when I, I'm on a place where it's a 300-foot drop-off? What it is is I respected that space, right? I wouldn't think just to dangle and dance on the edge because, matter of fact, honestly, when, you're, when it's that far, you're like any little breeze. You're like, what was that? Am I okay? You know, is that, that's, why? Because I respected and feared the capacity that environment had on my being. When we worship, yes, God is loving. Yes, he is good and kind, but my friends, when we come into the acknowledgement of God's presence, we have to realize God is majestic. God is huge. He has all authority. He is in control. Please, somebody say amen. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) We have to acknowledge that we are seeing God in that way. and get. That's why this this picture from heaven is so helpful for us, because John is getting exposed to that. The elders are falling down because they're seeing God. God in that way. And there's another physical gesture that happens. The elders also demonstrate another thing for us. Look what it says uh, in this verse. It says, they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory 
and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. They take their crowns and they lay them down. Now, crowns in the ancient time would have been very familiar. The, the Greeks and Romans would give crowns to kings. They'd also give crowns to uh, athletes. If you did well in a certain competition, they would give you like, a crown of like, uh, flowers and leaves. And that was an acknowledgement of all your accomplishments. And what the elders are doing, they're saying, we're taking all of our accomplishments, anything that's good to, about what we've ever done, and we're just laying it down before the Lord. I was chatting with somebody the other day, and they had an interesting comment. They said, when they first moved to the Silicon Valley, they would introduce themselves to people, and they heard a lot of this coming back, where folks would say, oh, my name's whatever, and I have a PhD from Berkeley. And she'd meet somebody else, and they'd say, oh, yeah, I was a grad student from Stanford. And it made this individual say, what's going on? Why is everybody giving me their resume as I'm meeting them? And I don't know if that's necessarily really unique to the Silicon Valley, but I think innately in all of us, isn't there? There's this image management that we do. We want you to know our accomplishments. I want you to know all that I've done and, and, and kind of hail that as. And what the elders model is when we have a downward movement in worship, we take all that we think are, is in the plus category for us, anything we think is an accomplishment, and we just lay it. It's really not that big of a deal. It's really, we're not really that worthy. The, the, the ancient writer would say this, all of your good deeds, all of your resume, it's filthy rags before God. That's kind of how he sees it. He sees our life in that way because we're so small. He is the worthy one. Now, up to this point, everybody's worshiping. It all looks good. But now it gets, it gets a little messier. Now it gets a little bit more raw. It gets a little bit more dramatic. I want you to look in chapter 5 with me, and let's read along. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, worthy, who is worthy to break the seals of the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I wept bitterly. John is in this scene where he's thinking through his own life and the suffering that he's going through, and he goes, wait a minute, is this how it ends? That there's, nobody's able to, what about the messy parts of my life? And he, now it's a movement upward in question. When we have a question, we look up and we say, who is worthy to restore all the messy places of my life? Who is really worthy? And in that scene, there is no one who is worthy. The scroll is really thought to contain all the plans of God. It's all the pieces of your life and my life that don't make sense and that are all brought together in this beautiful way. And really, no one is worthy to do that. And it, it, the tattered pieces of our lives just don't make sense and they're confusing. Why, why does God allow us to go through some of the, the hard times and pain that we experience? I was in a hospital room uh, just last month and a young kid was getting surgery and he looks me in the eye and he says, Mark, what is God doing here? I had to look and say, dude, I don't know. I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not the one who can make all sense of all this. That scroll contains all the plans of God that takes the tattered pieces of your life and my life and makes sense of it. I like the, how the scholar N.T. Wright says, the scroll contains God's secret plans to undo and overthrow the world-destroying projects that have already gained so much ground, and to plant and nurture instead the world rescuing project, which will get creation back on track and in the right direction. That scroll contains how God plans to take those ugly pieces of your life and my life and make sense out of it, to make wholeness out of that. And John sees that nobody's worthy for that, and it just tears him up. It's not hard to understand. I mean, if I'm honest before you, I look at some of the pieces of my life and I, it, it, it tears me up. <clears throat> so my father passed away this last week. And I, I, uh, for, for all the years I've known him, he's, he was a great mind um, and a loving dad. He was great. Uh, I watched him come home. He was, a, he was an employee at Lockheed. He'd say, oh, I, sold, I, I brokered a contract for millions of dollars with Lockheed. 
Um, I, he was a spiritual man. I listened to him one time uh, quote the entire book of James. He had a great mind. And in the last years of his life, all that left. And, you know, he, he wouldn't know his, you know, his, sorry. He wouldn't know his grandkids' names. And it was so hard for me to see somebody I respected just slowly lose all that stuff. And I remember saying, I, I, every time I'd go to visit him, I'm like, God, give me a capacity, because it just broke my heart. And, and as you bring those same things, right? The pieces of your life that you're like, how, how was that good, God? How did that fit with any plan? What, what makes sense in all of that? And John has to be bringing some of those same kind of issues. He's at the kind of the end, end of some things. He's like, God, who's really worthy to make sense of all of this? And it's at this point in the scene that, that Jesus emerges, and, and he's seen in a unique way. I won't take the time to read, but I'll just describe it. What they, what they say about him is he is the Lion of Judah. And all the, immediately, all the Hebrew people would know exactly what that meant. That's the one who was supposed to make sense. He was the Messiah. But they also say he's the Lamb of God. One is strength. The other one is vulnerability. Those two together with Almighty God has a potential to transform, transform your life and my life and to, who is worthy to make sense out of all those pieces. This is what it says in verse 8. When he took the scroll, Jesus... The four living beings and the 24 elders do what they do. They fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. And these are the words. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals and to open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people from God For God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. At that moment, with uncertainty, there's this great celebration as Jesus emerges as the lion and the lamb, and they look upward in celebration. And here's what I hope. When we look upward to try to make sense of the messes of our lives, we see that Jesus really is worthy to restore the created order. And that's what makes this such a great encore song. It's like cancer and Alzheimer's and suffering and pain. They don't get, they don't get the last word. Jesus is worthy to restore wholeness to life again. Amen, amen. One of the other things I just want to encourage you with that's really in in the last few weeks and this last week has encouraged me is, did you see the phrase in there that says that the bowls, God saves our prayers in little bowls? Did you, did you see that when I read that? Yes? No? Yes. I, I, it's, I'm, I'm like, what is that? What are our prayers that God would save them and hold on to them? I think of this, somebody gave a definition of prayer one time that says simply prayer is just dependency on God. And when we pray, God has to love that because that's saying we are not, in, we, are, we need your help. God loves that. And can I tell you, God loves your prayers. He loves the ones you pray quickly. He loves the ones you pray that are silly when you want a parking space, <laughs> you know? He loves the ones, the sweet ones you pray with your kids when you tuck them into bed, the ones you pray before a meal. He loves the ones you pray in anger, the ones you pray with tears. Why? Why? Because they're an acknowledgement that he is God and you are not. And God loves that. And can I encourage you guys, just as one of your pastors, you may feel at times like your, like your prayer is just wasted breath. It is not. God cherishes them so much, he holds on to them. He saves them. He keeps them in bowls around heaven. My friends, God hears your prayers and he remembers and as this scene now kind of comes to an end, this final movement that we're going to see is now this, scene, this movement backwards. It's a movement backwards in awe and reflection of who God is and what he's done. Verse 11, then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne. It's like he's saying there was just a gazillion people around and they're all singing. 
and the living beings and the elders. And they sing in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb. Say that. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang blessing and honor. Glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. You guys, spending time in God's presence, reorienting ourselves around his character and his work, bringing him our questions and the messy, pace, the messy places of our lives, that, that activity will reshape us. In the midst of all the uncertainty of life, when things seem to be spinning out of control, this picture gives us courage and hope. Pastor Adam Stockmiller has this little quote about this. He says, the more time you spend in God's presence, the more the cultural idiosyncrasies of that place will begin to shape you. Your anger will be changed to forgiveness, your despair to hope, your sorrow to joy, and on and on and on it goes. When you and I spend time in God's presence and we get our minds wrapped around who he is, that fills us in such an amazing way that it reshapes us. And my question for you is, what needs to be reshaped today? What do you bring into the building that by looking at God and his ability to be in control would start to transform and give you a sense of courage? This isn't the end game. My friends, what you're experiencing right now, this is not all there is. This is not all there is. There's an eternity out there and God is on the throne and he is in control and he is making sense out of it all. Now up to this point we've been looking up to heaven. I want to spin it around and I want us to look from heaven down to earth. Just before Voyager 1 space probe left our solar system in 1990, the late astronomer Carl Sagan requested that it just stop and take one more photo of earth. And this photo that I'm going to show you now is called the pale blue dot. And it shows our planet as a tiny speck in the vast universe. Can you see it up there? It's small. And very poetically, he writes this. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That is us. On it, Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives on that tiny little speck, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. You guys... In just a few minutes, you're going to leave this building. And your little kingdoms, my little kingdoms, are going to seem so big. The kingdoms of our kids and their schools and our activities around that, our jobs. When we spend time reorienting ourselves around God and the bigness of God and him on his throne, it has power and potential. Because can I tell you, we are so small. We are so small, and we think our kingdoms are so big, but in the light of that, we're just a speck. We're just a tiny drop of dust suspended on a moonbeam. But this thing that brings us strength and vitality and is such a joy is that God is on the throne. God is in the center, and my friends, God is large and in charge. He's in charge of your life, and he's in charge of my life. As we enter in this place, oh, that God would reshape our interior lives so that in the midst of the messes, we can rest confidently that he is on the throne. Would you pray along with me?
God, in the quietness of this moment, I, I just think of the faces that I see out there today, and I know some of what some people are going through. Issues re regarding jobs, and issues regarding health, and issues regarding the future, issues regarding conflict. And God, as we bring all these things to you, what we ask is you would help us wrap our mind around the image that you use to encourage John. These are the messes of our lives, God. These are the places where it feels like life is spinning out of control, where our world kind of is falling apart. And in the midst of that, we just pray as we spend time wrapping our minds around you on the throne, that the idiosyncrasies of this scene and of heaven would so shape us that you would transform our despair, our doubt, our frustration, our hurt, our pain, would you transform that into hope and courage and strength? You have the ability to do that because you are almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen.